Okay, now we're back. We're still looking at the Bar Kokhba Rebellion because it made it, it was a watershed in Israel's and church history. It's 132 to 135. B-A-R Kokhba is spelled K-O-C-H-B-A. Rebellion is the name of it that you can Google. And there are a lot of different articles you can find on it and you know, better and worse places, but it, they'll all be about the same. You really do need to look at that because um, the event resulted in the complete raising down of the city of Jerusalem, and what we call Jerusalem today is really built, is really that city that Hadrian created called Aelia Capitolina, and on the very Temple Mount, they built a pig temple to Jupiter, I think it was. Zeus, same thing. And the idea was to prevent the Jews from ever being able to live there again, and they were forbidden to go there except on Tishbaab. And on Tishbaab, they could go there just that day to mourn the loss of the temple. It's really important in Israel's history, it's real important in church history because it starts a trend that hasn't stopped until now of Jews petitioning to rebuild the temple. Now God said that ain't gonna happen until I return. Okay, that's in um, Ezekiel 40 and 39, 38, 37, which a whole lot of scholars misrepresent. And it's going to be, and it, you'll see it in Revelation, it is a trend of history that they will keep on trying to do it anyway. And those who misread Revelation 11 thinking that, yes, the temple gets rebuilt and it's a good thing, they're not reading God's sarcasm in that chapter. Satan is always moving history toward fake church, which is politicized church. Whether it's Catholic or not is kind of beside the point because it's always a politi political push. Pro-life today is an example of it. Pro-life is totally anti-Bible. I can't say enough bad things about it. And the opposite end of that is the attempt to build temple. Now in Revelation 11 there's some ambiguity about whether there's a building standing there at the time the two witnesses arrive at the beginning of the tribulation. And God is busy saying you know measure measure the site with a reed R-E-E-D and it's sarcastic. He means write about it. Okay the measuring is like to measure for a foundation, so if there's a building there, God's treating whatever the building is as if it were not there because he didn't authorize it. It's very scathing sarcasm in Revelation 11. And the idea is the two witnesses are there to keep people away from the Temple Mount. So from, from the time the Temple goes down here at the Bar Kokhba Rebellion resulting in Aelia Capitolina by 140 AD, until the end of the tribulation, there is going to be a movement to rebuild the temple, which may or may not be successful. And some pastors who don't know what they're doing misinterpret Revelation 11 and say, oh, you know, if the temple gets rebuilt, that means, you know, Israel is back in favor with God. Okay, that's what's going to drive Jews to want to go live in Jerusalem and make them sitting ducks in the tribulation. Okay, you do not want the temple rebuilt. And thankfully, most Jews know that. Most Jews do not favor building the temple. Okay, they, they recognize the problem of doing that. They recognize God doesn't want it done. God will bring, you know, Messiah will come and actually do it. They don't necessarily believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, but they do believe a Messiah will come, and of course, the one who's going to come back is the same one who was there before. But at least they know, no, don't rebuild. So that's why this is so important to look at in Ephesians 1, 6 in the top window, highlighted in black, and why so much time was spent on it, okay, to take you from 127 to 134 here in the Matthew text. Look, but don't be upset. Don't be fixated. Wanting to have a temple is a form of fixation. And the 127 to 134 period is right here. Okay. 
Tres Jaritos Alto. It's six syllables. All right, because he's using 133 on a different fiscal. But um, this is what you want to not do. You want to just say the grace of God, the grace of God. Wait on the grace of God. You know, wait on the Lord. Be Thank you, Dad. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will give you the desires of your heart. That's a concatenation of a lot of Old Testament verses. All right, mostly in the Psalms. That's what you're supposed to do. All right. Now, all that is a setup here. When you're waiting on God, what are you really doing? Everybody says, oh, I have faith. Yeah, you're treating your faith as something to be proud of. No, you have faith because God is good, not because you are dummy. All right? But what are you really doing? You're voting. We're getting ready to vote in a presidential election where Donald Trump is, as far as I'm concerned now, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming. The guy might as well be Hitler reincarnate. Okay, he's, he's using the exact same playbook that Hitler used. I have never seen a worse presidential candidate ever in my life that you had more proof on, more immediately, more documented proof that this guy is a charlatan, a liar, a scammer, he hates everybody, he's just out to use everybody, and you know, it's, it's just the worst possible description. And here's what's important about that in this context. He is a perfect example. Look at the slavish, drooling attention he gets from his supporters. And they don't care what the truth is. They don't even want to look it up. And they're nasty, and they're vile, and they lie, and they're violent. They're the ugliest people. They have the ugliest souls I have ever seen in my life. And they are a perfect representation of the following of the Antichrist. Donald Trump is not the Antichrist. He's too stupid. But the slavish attention that he's getting when he says absolutely nothing to deserve it and says everything that should deserve him to be hated gives you an example of how Satan works. He gives you a fixation. And of course, those of us who are against Trump are likely, you know, likewise, you know, what do you want to call it? tempted and maybe even guilty of, and I'm probably one of them, guilty of fixation against Trump. So you're fixated for him for no good reason. And then you're fixated against him because the others have no good reason. That's Satan's tactic. And that's what Christ is saying here. Look, because you got to be informed, but don't get fixated. Don't be disturbed. Don't be frightened. Don't get all involved in it. In other words, you have to be informed because you're a believer, you're a king in training. Don't get fixated. All right? And instead of being fixated, what you're supposed to say is, So what I should be saying when I'm so tempted, for the first time in my life, I'm tempted to do violence against Trump. I'm not going to, obviously. You know, I haven't shot a gun in 60 years or 50 years, so I'm not going to learn how now. All right, but I'm tempted. I think about it. Well, that's bad. That means I'm fixated. That means I'm violating, you know, the lower screen, verse 6b, highlighted in sort of greenish right now. And a whole lot of other people are thinking that same way. I, I really doubt that guy ever gets to the nomination, that he's going to survive to be president. And I'm certain he's not going to be elected. Okay? I'll even vote Democratic if it's to avoid him. But that's still fixation, okay? It's wrong. I should instead be saying, Tez Haritu Satu, Tez Haritu Satu, you can do something about this and just wait on God. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He'll give you the good desires of your heart. And again, that's a concatenation of a number of verses, some in ne Nehemiah and some in, in Isaiah and some in mostly in Psalms. That's what we need to do. But people are fixated on the temple being rebuilt people are fixated on political christianity okay and we can see it in, you know an example of why happening right now in our day so that you can get better understanding of how fixated people were back in 132 to 135 AD that instead of saying this tes haritu satu your glory your grace your grace your grace they were tresete they were being upset about it. That's why they fell. 
When you get your eyes off God, you fall. One John one nine, get back on the horse. Okay? Now that sounds like I'm turning this into some kind of a lesson, but it's part of the text. It's part of what the text is saying. Because see, here's the destruction of Jerusalem gonna happen. That's like the hardest, worst thing that can happen to a Jew. Alright? And a lot of Christians were living there too. It was the hardest, worst thing that could happen to them. So imagine the devastation. Imagine how hard it would be to just keep saying, You just don't want it. What you want to do is tear your hair out and be upset. Like, to rest the days, if that were a command. Alright? So that's why you have to remember the 50 and the 57 because it's the end times. It's not going to last. God's ha got a plan for it. As bad as it is. Alright. So now that I've set that up. Okay, at this point we're looking at 134 in this text. And a different fiscal year, 133 here. So then our next question is to get us down to the 70. Because I was explaining how essentially you're waiting on God. You're voting. Well, 70 is about voting, okay? See, divine time, oh, I can't even move it. Divine time, uh, oh, we won't work on this machine. Okay, I just got to talk about it. Apparently on a 64-bit machine, I can't use a calculator. Divine time is divided up into 490 plus 70 plus 490 equals 1050. The 70 in the middle is for believers in mass to vote to learn Bible. If not enough for doing it, and it could be just one, if not enough for doing it, time ends and the world ends. So voting to just believe, just believe, just just grace is grace is grace is grace is grace is grace. Get me through the moment is grace. That's a voting. And it buys time. That's the point. So that's what he's saying here. Look, remember all these things are going to have to happen, but the end is not yet. Upo. That's a Greek word. That's what you said to your kids when they said, Are we there yet? Not yet. U, not. Po. Not yet. Not yet. Upo. Not yet. Not yet, children. Upo. Upo. It's not yet the end. Totelos means the end. All right? So that's what you got to remember when you got your eyes all fixed on the election or whatever is bothering you right now. His grace, his grace, his grace, and then whoop -o. It's not yet, it's going to come, but it's not now. All right? So that's why he does it at 50, and he's got the 7 in the middle, but it doesn't, the cumulative syllables don't 7. Because he wants to get to 70 and say, look, all this stuff I've been telling you, Going all the way back here. Alright? All that stuff I've been telling you is part of your voting time. Time to vote. You're voting to wait on me, to, God. You're voting to wait on me to make good on it. You're voting to wait on me. You're voting to wait on me. You're voting to wait on me. It would have been real easy for him to say this slightly differently and have the syllables seven but he didn't because he's basically saying it ain't over till the fat lady sings and the fat lady ain't gonna sing until the 70 is up okay this is where the mass is important enough people voting to know God buys time otherwise the world ends so don't think what you're saying what you're doing or you're saying in your life is not important important now, at the same time, this is another 13 syllables, and it takes us, I wish I could use the calculator, but I can't. It takes us from um, 134 to 144, 147, and you'll notice that's exactly where Paul ends it. So you see, he's really tracking to the Matthew text. Okay, he's taking it to 147. All right? Now, in that 147, since the calculator doesn't work, I might as well open this up. Go back to the 147.
that's 14. 14 means, you know, a period of, of, you know, really pivotal period in history, a period of growth, and a period of testing, and a period that's tribulation quality. It's got all those meanings to it in 14. Because that was the initial period that Laban was supposed to be served by Jacob. Okay, it's like indenture. The concept of indenture. Alright, so that's the sort of doctrinal analogy being made in the meter there at one at 147 and so at the end of verse 60 in the lower lower um, corner of the window which you see the 13 that's highlighted it's saying 13 but you know the total ends up meaning like a 14 because it ends up totaling at 147 there all right at the end of verse 6 vote 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 and that brings you to the end see the word here the end this is so clever the way Paul is tying to the text, the end, that's totelos, okay, when you hear the word in English, teleological, that's where it's coming from, telos means the end, all right, and so Paul cleverly, and that's why I got to show you Ephesians here, Paul cleverly comes to the end of the first season, the spring of church, it adds up to a 91, 91 has two meanings in the Bible, okay it's one of the meanings means like a season you know because there's 364 days really 365 but the 365th day begins piggyback of the end of the 364th day okay so you got four seasons spring summer when spring what is it spring summer autumn fall i'm um, spring summer fall winter sorry so paul divides his text in 91s to show now this is the spring of church you know church is new there's a lot of a lot of growth that this is this is a good sign positive number of growth here's a little tribulation quality time more growth and then growth under pressure and then pivotal will you make it to the 147 mark and then that ends up being a 91 because oops uh, Wait a minute. Because this 56, which is his dateline, is outside this box. This box is where the 21 and the 7 and the 21, 28, 14. This is all a separate season. The 56 was kind of like a preamble. Here's the past. This is when Paul's writing. And in order to, so you can get the sarcasm of the whole passage, he sets you up starting when Christ is born with little cute references to the Caesars that were passed so you can if, clue into his sarcasm so that going forward prophetically you can recognize the key words and then when you go through those periods of time you'll know who they reference like this is this is Nero all over it's like his theme song alright stuff like that okay so when you get down here alright Alright, I'm not sure that's the, the cadence that he'd use, but it seems like Peter's using that. Then you know, oh wow, this is, you know, the climactic period. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of suffering though. Okay. And that ends the spring of church. Whereas this part here is all walled off because it's the past not future because that Paul's writing when Christ should have been age 56 all right and everything inside the box is yet future so that's the yet future portion of church as it were to show you trends to show you meaning to show you line by line year by year what's going to happen and then he's tying that all the way through AD 147 right here to what Christ is saying in verse 60 okay so Paul's meter is at AD 147 at that point okay notice again here we got it 21 and 70 is 91 and here we got 91 what I'm the reason I'm going through all this detail is I want you to see how surgically and precisely you can prove what Paul is doing with the text 
you know, because if you just look at these words, they're pretty syrupy. Okay. <laughs> Where the glory is, God the Father. You know, it almost sounds like you're hearing a preacher talk. But you got this historical underpinning. And it's very funny and satirical and in some cases very biting. Okay. So it ends up having an entirely different base. It's not that it's untrue. It's got a different kind of application to each period in history that he's covering. Plus, while you're looking at it, you're to be reminded, hi, I'm actually causing you, I'm, this is like indexing or a, like a concordance. He wants you to be looking at those paragraphs, that section of Matthew 24. That's why he's doing this. This is how they, this was their kind of mechanism of indexing and concordance, because they memorized everything by syllable counts which Christendom doesn't even know. So all of this meaning that we think we might see in this text, there's some meaning you can get out of it, but man oh man, the story is really different when you know he's keying it to the first 10 years of Christ's life and the history and the culture and you know certain particulars about that, okay? That you're supposed to relate to that time, all right? And not only that, but, and I didn't cover it before, but I'm going to do that now. Um, these verses. This is the text that Paul is starting right here. And his 56 is covering that. It is not covering katemenu dautu. Okay? It's not covering that because Christ is no longer sitting on earth. Christ is sitting in heaven. It's very clever. So the text here that you see highlighted in blue in the lower window, okay, corresponds to the 56, which is the past. The past. Not the future. The past. To set the tone and so that you know what, how the sarcasm is going to work. And it is really sarcastic. Look at this. Praise be to God, our Father, the Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which sounds like syrupy, meaningless text. Okay, but the backdrop he's pairing it with is upon the Mount of Olives, you know, each one, each of the disciples kind of privately went to Christ and said, you know, tell, tell me, tell us, what, what, when, when is all this stuff going to happen? In other words, they're drooling over events. They are not saying, they're not praising God. They're not thinking about God. They're thinking about, you know, drooling over the rapture. Just like we do today. See the contrast? See the sarcasm? Okay? And the other difference in this text is when he's doing all this, this is 30 AD. When he's doing it here, this is 1 AD, you know, when Christ is born. All the way to his age 56. This is what should have been. That's the key phrase here. It's what should have been as far as Christians go. It's what did happen as far as the emperors and what should have been as far as Christians. So it's satirical with respect to Christians in that it didn't happen the way it was supposed to and his proof of that is this text right here. Because here they are drooling over the signs and the events instead of saying praise be to God. You know, you've given me every spiritual blessing. They don't want spiritual blessings. They want drooling over historical events. That's how retarded the disciples were. Now, the important lesson there, of course, is if they were this retarded, then you can be too. But why do you want to be? But don't hold them up as spiritual giants because they were his disciples. That's what baby Christians now do. Oh, the church fathers. Oh, if I had only been alive in Jesus' day. Oh, they were his disciples. Assuming that because they were his disciples, they were, you know, like, wonderful people. No, they were retards. And the proof that they were retards is right here. They come to him and say, Oh, tell us when this is going to happen and what will be the signs. They don't have God on their mind. So he's basically telling you also the character of the time in his lifetime when he's writing you up to the time of when Christ should have been 56. 
that the same retardedness you see here in Matthew 24 verse 3 is the same retardedness that exists when Paul was living and of course he himself characterizes himself as the worst sinner who ever lived so he was no angel either okay we gotta stop treating the people in the Bible as if they were paragons of virtue because then you don't learn what the Bible is saying the Bible is saying they were putzes so are you so you can learn just like they did that's the message David was a putz there were times even when Moses was a putz. Okay, so don't put them on some high level and therefore not learn the lesson that, that God gave them. And God gives us through them. Alright? So he's saying, oh look, these people were real jerks. All they care about is the signs and the wonders. They don't care about ulogetas, hoteos, capatel. Huh? Ulogetas, jamás, the one blessing us. See, this is about, look what we got. And they're busy saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Oopo, not yet. That was the past. That's past is prologue, of course. We're still drooling like they did. So then we come back to verse 4, and that's where he starts going forward in time, like I've covered before. There's a time in Nero. Okay? And I've taken you now through the first 147, which ends right uh, la, 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 la. right here. The first 147 ends right here. And in Paul, it's right here. Now, here's your homework. If you manage to survive all this time watching these videos, that means you're really interested in this stuff. I've done enough for the spring of church through syllable 147, AD 147, so that you yourself ought to be able to start playing the game yourself. Now you got Ephesians 1 read parse, you can use the HTM, but the Greek text won't be readable unless you have Bible font, Bible works fonts. Um, and when you go to the chrono chart here, this, this, these are the syllable years or the AD years, and like for example, we just stopped at 147, and see here's 147, and here's the key word sarcasm that Paul is using, and then here is the emperor who was in power during that time, which I haven't discussed here because it's not particularly relevant at this moment, and then when you see these little links like this, okay? Those are independent links you can look up, like this is at RomanEmpress.org, one of my favorite sites, where you can look up, well, who's Lucius Verus, who's Marcus Aurelius, and then what about Christian anti-Semitism, because that's a, when it really starts to run high, it's in the 140s, because of the Bar Kokhba Rebellion, okay, because, you know, you're persona non grata if you're a Jew now. Okay, officially because of Hadrian. Here's a link to Hadrian. And these are all sites not related to me. Okay, I wish that didn't happen. But that's a particular book about how they were petitioning Hadrian to rebuild the temple on the Holy of Holies. That was one of the problems during the time, and that's what resulted in the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. And then here's a link to the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. Okay. So these are independent links. They have nothing to do with me. I just found sites on the internet which I thought were pretty helpful in explaining the historical background that goes with the meter. So you can do that. And then what you, what you can also do, you know, is go back to the verses. Where are they? Here we go. Verses. And you can start playing now yourself with, okay, well, you saw Brain Out do it matching up the text, looking at the history, matching up the text that goes here with the history, and how does the, the Pauline text play on the Matthew 24 text, and what was happening in history that makes this ironic or sarcastic or biting, because it does. And then, of course, you got this. Here's the season, that's spring, and then it keeps on going. You got, this is, this is summer, okay, then there's 
I'm not going to explain this right now. It's it's too exp you know too confusing because I've given you too much. Here's fall, okay, and then this last bit starting in verse 13 of Ephesians 1:13. There's no subdivisions, so this is winter. In other words, almost nobody's growing in Christ, and that's from. And this is the time when Constantine comes into power. He dies, Constantine dies, right here at Proel in 337 A.D. By 343 A.D., his sons are basically murdering each other and everybody else over whether God is one or three. So there's no growth. And that's the winter of church. Now, how does that match up with the rest of the text in Matthew 4? Well, that's your homework assignment. Peace out.